Uh, the top story is, here's the headline, as countries ranging from Indonesia to Mexico aim to attract digital nomads, locals say, not so fast. Uh, I think what they are talking about here, uh, some of these things are things that we've seen locally because this is a big long-term expat community that has changed the local community. Mm -hmm. And I hope to think that uh, the changes that have come from us is more benign than some of the stuff they're talking about from the digital nomads. Because I think in the people I know anyway are a little more uh, respectful of the locals. Well, uh, you know, I think I think when you have uh, anyway, are you running down all of them, or are we? Oh, I was running them? down them, but your comments are always welcome. <laughs> okay, so the next story is uh, someone is making an entire movie using video generated by AI, video and audio. And so the whole movie is coming from AI. And, uh, you know, I think this will end up being a big deal. It turns out the guy who is doing it, uh, there are two things he's not. One of them is a movie maker and the other is an AI guy. But <laughs> those limitations don't seem to stop him. And in environment uh, from the world is on the brink of five disastrous tipping points so says a study if you look at it in more detail they have identified not just these five that start to occur around 1.5 sea rise where we are, but they've identified in total 18. So we have, if we don't take care of things, uh, we will have a series of disasters coming as the temperatures rise. Oh boy. Uh, in uh, biology, I have a story about the animal translators. We may have heard the story about they're trying to use AI to learn to communicate with dogs and cats, but the research is way broader than that. And it's very, very interesting work. The human story is from Japan. And it's based on a book that has become very popular there. It was unexpected that it was so popular. Uh, it's a, about a new way of life, which is a Marxist post-capitalist green manifest, manifesto that has become very popular with uh, Japanese young people who are looking, I guess, for some other way to base their life where maybe they'll have a future or something. Those kids. And then I have a couple of medical stories. One of them is why are American lives getting shorter? It turns out with the COVID epidemic, uh, it uh, in the first year, the life uh, lifespans of all the developing countries went down. In the second year, uh, the lifespans were covered in uh, 19 out of 21 developed countries. One of the countries that the lifespan is still declining in is America, our home. 
And uh, the last story is uh, a COVID story. And in India and China, both places have approved new nasal COVID vaccines. And uh, the question about these really is, will they be a game changer? There is evidence that the nasal vaccines, besides giving you immunity, then uh, reduce transmission to other people because they kill the virus when it just comes in. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what we have on tap for today. And let me get started. Uh, now, workers now are eager around the world to embrace the flexibility of not being tied to an office. And there are cities and countries around the world that are figuring out ways to attract these people to them. And these uh, include ideas of stretching the meaning of tourism to include these remote workers. Uh, there are countries now that are offering, quote, digital nomad visas that uh, allow for longer stays and uh, give different work rules. In some places, when we were in India, for example, if you were going to go work in India, you needed a different kind of visa. And so countries are understand that as issues, and some of them are trying to attract these digital nomads. But there is, not surprisingly, pushback from locals in cities around the world, like in Barcelona and in Mexico City. Yep. And it's made uh, it's clear that there are costs and benefits of the remote workers and the money guys like the costs and the people or like the benefits and the people don't much care for the costs it seems. And uh, this work tourism comes with uh, several significant drawbacks. Uh, one is they wear out their welcome. Uh, they're welcome when they begin, but after they've been there for a while, uh, they may not be so welcome. And one big classic example is are places like Venice, which just can't stand that many people. In Mexico City, residents fear displacement by these remote workers who are able to pay higher rents. So mm -hmm. when it's not just Mexico City, by the way, I've heard of with this a year ago, there were a series of articles about the impact in the US where these digital nomads would go into some attractive small town in the country, buy up all of the real estate, make the land crisis, prices, go out of whack and uh, displace the local people and try to take over local politics. And it turns out the locals don't like that much. Uh, then one of the other things that happens with the digital nomads is the cultures become commodified. And this gentrification of these people who can pay higher rents creates a power imbalance that favors the newcomers with money and erodes local ways of life. And there's a distinction between people who want to learn about the place they're in and those who move there just because it's cheap. Yeah. And uh, there's a quote here from uh, a digital nomad living in Mexico City. He says, quote, I've met a number of people who don't really care they're in Mexico, 
They just care that it's cheap. Yeah. And uh, while conventional tourists come and go and stay short times, these remote workers stay for weeks or months or longer. And they then use places and resources that have been traditionally dedicated to local residents. Then also digital nomads look to stretch their dollars. And so these are privileged tourists that ultimately change the economies and demographics of an area. Their buying power increases costs and displaces local residents. And one of the things that contributes to this are services like Airbnb, where the Airbnb actually makes it easy for digital nomads to find and rent apartments for weeks or months. And people around the world are becoming increasingly alarmed at how quickly such rentals can change the nature of neighborhoods, the affordability and character of the place. And these digital nomads, because they're looking for a low cost, then they choose low cost destinations and they particularly have an impact in these low cost destinations because their money really uh, while it goes further for them, it disrupts the local economy a lot more. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that happens is this, the locals then many times come to see these uh, digital tourists as transforming something that they had before and they loved and cherished. So, you know, can, those kind of feelings can go pretty deep. And while it's true, remote employees still make up a small portion of the overall tourist population, their work needs and longer stays means they're much more likely to use services and places frequented by locals. So they're much more likely to impact the actual lives of local than normal tourists. So it's a whole different phenomenon. And so I actually have a couple of questions. One of these is, you know, the changes that we're talking about, we've seen those in Lakeside, and how how do you see these kind of changes affecting the life around us here? Well, it's been going on for a while. Back in 2019, when we took a Mexican manners course, uh, a lot of the people in in uh, quote unquote the village, meaning right in Ahihik couldn't afford it anymore and had to move out. And then there are other people who've moved in to service the expat community. One of the anecdotes was uh, one of the locals went to the um, plaza taxi stand and there's the taxi, but nobody in it, but there's a guy sitting on a bench nearby. And he said, oh, do you know when the driver will be back? And the guy just shrugged. And then a little later, so so the locals waiting for the taxi driver to show up because he needs to take the taxi. A little later, an expat shows up looking for a taxi and the guy on the bench, oh yeah, come on and get, and so it was the taxi driver that wasn't going to drive a local because the uh, an expat or a tourist was going to give him a much bigger tip. Mm. This was an anecdote that they told in the class. Not only a bigger <laughs> tip, but probably... Uh, a bigger fare because the fare system is gringo fares and Mexican fares, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's a good story. And a good gets... story. Yeah, I've uh, entertained, I've had that happen to me repeatedly too. We, we actually were in Trinidad working one, one time and uh, hollered for a taxi. They have route taxis there. 
And the route taxi just goes along a established route and picks up people right. as like, they go and like drops people off. It's like a like a little tiny bus. Well, they saw two gringos that needed a ride and uh, pulled over, kicked everybody off, and we got in and went to our destination. Okay, so it's a it's a worldwide thing that happens. Yes, and, uh, but you know, in reading this article, I just came to the conclusion that just really not much can be done about it with the yeah. uh, information age that we are in, the internet. Uh, uh, I know people that have lived at Lakeside for ten years, working, working from abroad or working full time, and mm -hmm. uh, and you know they're part of the digital nomads, I guess. Right. So, I, I, now that you speak about it, I have uh, friends like that too. Yeah, it's uh, it's just part of kind of a social evolution that's taking place, whether at Lakeside or in Trinidad or, uh -huh. or wherever. It's just, I don't see anything that could be done about it. Yeah. Well, one of the things you can do about it, when I was in uh, India, the fastest internet I could get was really 56K. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there's a lot of stuff I couldn't do. So you could just keep your internet crappy. One of the things I've wondered about here is with these uh, increasing speeds of the fiber internet services that are available locally, I wonder if that has attracted more workers because I know in the days of Telmex, uh, some of my friends were complaining about the bandwidth if you're doing heavy stuff then uh, Telmax speeds are not enough. But now we can come in and have 50 or 100 megabits per second and do it pretty cheap. I think there was a trend to gentrification uh, before digital nomads. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, my parents were, well, the first trip that my dad and my uncle took to Mexico was 1950. And ah, okay. um, then, uh, I mean, the expat community has been around Ajijic and San Miguel as well for a long time. I mean, it was more common to be the, um, you, you know, the retired snowbirds. But then the trend has been, uh, I heard this while hiking, and I can't remember because I would come down, my, my dad uh after my mom died in 2014, I would make sure to come and visit every year. Well, actually, no, it was after my dad's heart attack in 1991, and my mom bought the first house, which was actually in Ahihik, then sold that one and bought one in Riberas, and then sold that one and bought in Chapala's Hacienda due to the wars, mm -hmm. <laughs> the coetes, <laughs> which really bothered my mom. Anyway, um, it... It seemed so, so hiking, I can't remember when, but that it was seven, eight years ago that you started to hear about people who were retiring permanently to, to the lakeside area because their pensions wouldn't pay in, in the US. They, they, so that they, they had to find somewhere cheaper to live. And these mm -hmm. were, you know, pensioners. Mm -hmm. So, like us yeah well yeah I, th I don't know how accurate this is this guy was uh, d d i don't know just a youtube video that somebody shared oh i know what he was talking about he was talking about how the mexican government keeps increasing the the income that you mm -hmm. need to become a permanente mm -hmm. and his comment was that a middle class uh north american income puts you in the top one percent of Mexican incomes. Now, I have no idea whether there's any truth in that or not. Well, I suspect it's true. I tried to figure out where we're, my wife and I would be with a $3,000 a month Social Security income. And I think it puts us at about the top 2%. Uh, now, uh, we were 
spent uh, eight years in India before we came here and the place we were in India drew a bunch of uh, Westerners, they call them Westerners instead of gringos, and had been there, had been drawn to this place for 50 years. So there was uh, this Westerner community and stores trying to uh, cater to their needs and restaurants and things like this catering to their needs and certainly I could get a rickshaw driver immediately any place I should anyway and so you know like uh, you were saying Chad this stuff is going on around the world and in India, they had problems with us because in the Indian system, then foreigners are untouchables because we don't have a caste and so we don't mm -hmm. fit anywhere. So the place they have is at the very bottom, but we were untouchables with money. Mm -hmm. So it, they had to figure out how to deal with that. And I think they had to feel, figure out how to deal with that in places like Bali and uh, other places around the world because the digital nomads are spreading out around the planet. The requirement is good internet service and the ability to get a visa where you can work. Well, and gentrification happens in cities Anyway, you know, older parts of of cities that become like Cabbage Town in Toronto, where I live. Um, it it was called Cabbage Town because the Victorian houses were built for the railroad workers, and they would grow cabbages in the backyard and the front huh? yard uh, because you know you, the, the, the Irish railroad workers and potato and cabbage that was the you know the staple. And and now it's a very trendy upscale neighborhood. You know, you couldn't touch a house here for the townhouses here. The newer townhouses are a million and a half dollars. Mind you, they're Canadian dollars, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, also what I saw happening in California was still you would have an area that was kind of a low cost rundown area. Then it would attract the artists because the artists need places to live and work. And once there were a bunch of artists there, it was attractive to all of these other people and they would move in and the artists couldn't afford it anymore. So they would move out. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. think that happens in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. yeah. anyway, so uh, the other question I have is, are you aware of many digital nomads here? Is that something that has affected us or is we have, have we escaped it? Or does anyone know? I, I don't know. I don't, I just, I only know a few people there. Uh -huh. well, we, we all know a few people. There, there must be a, a lot of people, I would uh -huh. guess. Oh, and, oh no! I just mean I know a few neighbors, and they're retired, so I I don't know. Uh, well, uh, one of the things I do see while I'm going around is uh, there is a population of younger gringos, and it makes me wonder. There are some younger gringos that um, have YouTube channels, and so they, you know, they're they expound on their ideas yes. of Mexico yes. and, and uh -huh. like that, and then hope to get enough ads to make it worth their while. But I don't, I think that's the bottom feeder of the, of the, right. um, uh -huh. of digital nomads. Uh -huh. Could be, but uh, that's, I think we are in the wrong demographic to really understand that culture. True. CBC Hello there, Radio. Norman. CBC Radio had a comment about the, the Mexico City digital nomads and how it was um, putting people out of joint. And they had some 
you know, examples of, uh, the, you know, the digital nomads that find a cafe that they like and they hang around in there and they're speaking. Well, as my dad used to say, um, sorry, this is the Canadian point of view. He, he quoted somebody saying, doesn't anybody talk American here? We okay. Canadians. Yes, like, we've heard that language. Hey, Norman, do you know any digital nomads who live in Lakeside? Okay. And again, I, I suspect that we may not know because we're the wrong demographic. We're a little bit the uh, wrong age group. I say, I see young people on the street as I'm driving by, and I just wonder. Well, if you see them in, in company with somebody with hair like this, then it's the kids visiting the retired parents. Right. I see them with people not like hair like this. So anyway. So the next story is a, a technology story. And I think it's one of... Uh, things getting pretty different here let me i'm just trying to adjust my screen excuse me well i fiddled with it and see if i can do it okay uh and a guy a man with no background in film and no background in artificial intelligence is making an entire movie to generalize to demonstrate the capability that generative AI capabilities can have. And this is AI generating voice and AI generating images. Uh, he controls it really by just putting in the images, he just puts in a few words describing the scene and it comes up with the whole set of image. And so he's making a movie there and the movie is, uh, he thinks, showing uh, the kind of capabilities that are gonna be coming. This particular film is about space travelers who encounter some planet with an overgrown of strange salt. And uh, he is allowing uh, Twitter followers uh, to determine the direction of the movie by uh, making suggestions to them and giving polls to them about what should happen in particular places. So uh, the movie is being generated by these inputs from uh, the Twitter users. And, you know, in the end, he's going to have the movie he does there. Maybe he's going to have a director's cut too. He doesn't know. But uh, here, what he is doing is using a model that lets the viewers basically write their own scenes in the movie. So uh, this is a different way to go about movies. And he says uh, that we're on the verge of a new era. And he believes this is as big an invention as photography. And he says, to be honest, maybe as big as the invention of writing. Now, I'm not sure if this is bigger than writing. I think writing has done pretty well for itself. But, uh, you know, it's a big deal. And he says uh, he, uh, given how audacious his project is, it's hard not to see the beauty in his ideas. And uh, I imagined from listening to him here, imagine this. Uh, now it's another, maybe it's another 10 years in the future. Everybody has better computers than they do now and 
stuff like this. And now maybe there's a new service that becomes available on your computer. I'm calling it TV for you. And uh, here, uh, the basis of this is they have some basic story and uh, maybe you make some choices saying you want an adventure, you want to watch an adventure, or you want to enjoy a romance, or you want to just have a feel-good family story. So maybe you make choices like that. And then doing things like using your camera to watch your face, to watch your pupils of your eyes, they have emotional feedback for how you're reacting and then they can use your emotional feedback and reactions to drive the arc of the story to give you the kind of story you want and it can be just for you so that's my imagination i've been fascinated go ahead please the computer Computer games are a bigger business than film, than yes. cinema. Yes. And the, the rather lifelike images. Right. And they're, all of those are getting better and better. I know I played computer games for more than 30 years. And in that time, half of my computer <laughs> upgrades were because I didn't have good enough video capabilities to play the next game. So the, the game playing puts more demand on my computer than working does. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we can't help it. Also, this computer-generated movie, what I didn't talk about is I bet they also will have product placements in it. And the product placements that are in the computer-generated movie will be based on all the information that Google or somebody has about you and what you want and what you react to emotionally. And so it's all stuff that will be designed to get the strongest emotional reaction so you'll buy their stuff. And that way they can offer the movie for free. Anyway, other comments? Yeah, the big thing that will be missing is that people like to talk about the common movie or show that they've seen. Right, the shared Hey, did experience. you like that scene in, in Top Gun Maverick? Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. Even, even if you're at home in your own living room. Mm -hmm. Hey, the shared experience. So if everybody's getting... <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Yes. No, no. The shared experience thing in my own lifetime went through a change in the 50s and 60s and 70s when there were just these three TV networks. Then you would go to work and people would have watched the same show. Then when cable came in, everybody was watching something different. So the shared experience component went away for me. But not with movies. Not with movies. You're right on. But they can still have big screen movies. But everybody can't have their own movie that way. But the... There's still a lot of shared experience with with you know Game of Thrones. My experience right. with that is no, thank you. That's like right. That anyway, you're certainly right there. Uh, I have my wife's son also watches uh, Game of Thrones, and with this new series, I try to get a ta torrent download of the episode since I won't pay for HBO. And then after it's over, I have a conversation with him about the episode. And we bond better about the Game of Thrones episodes than we do about a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So, hmm, 
the shared experience <laughs> with the custom crafted media is going to be yet another change. Uh, yes, well, and it'll be the guys who have the uh, custom crafted experience because they're the ones with the remote, right? <laughs> <laughs> If you're watching it on the TV or everybody's right. watching it on their own computers, so. Anyway, that gets us into a whole nother area that I'm afraid to deal with. Because <laughs> I know as a guy, I have this basic knowledge that I'm wrong. <laughs> and if I asked my wife about it, she would say that she's surprised it took me so long to figure it out. Oh, yes. Okay, so let's continue. Hello there, Arden, by the way. Great. Good to see you. Now, the, the next story is a, a biology story, and it's about the animal translators. And I think we may have all have heard about things that they're trying to do to have AI figure out how to let you communicate with your dog or your cat. Uh, I bet the dog would want to talk to you. I'm not sure about the cat, but uh, they're doing this much more broadly than I had realized. Uh, the article starts talking about the naked mole rat. Now, and they say the make naked mole rat may not be much to look at, but it looks like they have a lot to say. And so they live in large underground colonies and they have an elaborate vocal repertoire, including whistles, trills, uh, grunts, uh, hiccups and uh, other hisses and other sounds. And uh, when two of these rats meet in a dark <laughs> tunnel, they exchange a standard greeting. Hi, rat! <laughs> and uh, so it's like when they meet, they have a little conversation. And not only does each rat have its own vocal signature so the AI can tell the rats apart, which makes them think the rats can tell the rats apart. But it turns out each colony has its own distinct dialect. That's one of the things I had wondered about the animal communication is you know, could a cat or a deer or a dog or a mole rat that is local speak the same language as one in some other place? So it turns out they have different dialects. So even for mole rats, language is learned. It's not innate. And since it's learned, then different groups, different cultures can have different dialogues dialects and the dialects are passed down generation to generation just like humans but it turns out in times of social instability like when uh there a new queen conquers and kills the old queen of the colony then uh the language is shaken up for a while and then under the new queen, a new dialect forms. So the language changes. And uh, the scientist who studied them was saying the greeting call, which I thought was going to be pretty basic, turned out to be incredibly complicated. And uh, she started to use machine learning to help them uh, to help with their research. And now in recent years, scientists uh, around the world have been deploying this kind of technology to try to decode animal 
communication and doing things like developing a comprehensive catalog of crow calls and uh -huh. the syntax of sperm whales and of course with dolphins and things like this and trying to build technologies that could allow humans to talk back and uh the field is young but uh growing fast and there are many projects now that are in their infancy and the wor work is already revealing that animal communication is a lot more complex than it sounds to the human ear. The human ear has a narrow bandwidth that it can hear. For example, the animals are able to hear broader sounds. And using machine learning algorithms, then they're able to spot subtle pat patterns that elude the human listeners and these programs can tell apart the voices of individual animals. So they're able to get down into the detail and distinguish between sounds that the animals make in different circumstances. And uh, this, they're able to break the sounds down into smaller components, which is a critical step if you're trying to analyze and decode language. So uh, an example of the work they're done, there is a uh, AI system developed that is called Deep Squeak. And Deep Squeak originally was designed to analyze and categorize the ultrasonic uh, vocalizations of rodents. And they found if you can do this, then you're getting a direct subjective from the animal's point of view of how the animal feels. You can tell if they feel good or bad by the way they squeak. And, uh, since then, they've used deep squeak with other species. An example of it is detecting when clucking chickens are in distress. So uh, I can see that it could be of use to the animal husbandry people. And uh, then the next part of it is decoding the meaning of these animal calls is not easy, of course. It takes a lot of data showing the context uh, uh, that surrounds the communication and the interaction with the other animals. And for example, using this uh, kind of approach with Egyptian fruit bats, they're able to see that these bats uh, struggle with each other. They lived in crowded conditions and there's a lot of intergroup quarreling and conflict and the machine learning systems can tell whether uh, this uh, conflict is related to food or mating or perching positions or sleep. So they're starting to get some insight into it. Uh, the SETI project, the Cetaceous Translation Institute is working with sperm whales and they have a series of clicks that are kind of like Morse code in sequences they call codas. And they're in the process of installing whale listening stations around the world that are going to work in conjunction with robotic fish to record audio and video of the whales and they're trying to decipher the syntax and language of whales and so uh, there are more projects like the earth species project has been trying to decipher hum 
back whale communication for some time and what their approach is playing pre-recorded whale calls through underwater speakers and seeing how the whale is reacting. To push it a little further, they're inventing new whale sounds and putting them out to the whale and see how the whale responds to new language. And so uh, this has uh, the prospect of ongoing two-way dialogue with other species. We really don't know how well we're going to be able to do that. That is the final objective of a lot of these projects. But uh, they have a caution here, which is there have to be motivation on both sides to want to communicate. You know, because we could communicate to a mole rat, does it mean the mole bat wants to talk to us? I don't know. As I say, I think the dog, my dog would want to talk to me. I'm not sure about my cat. And so this is one of the areas that is opening up and uh, using AI for to understand and interact with animal communication is a whole new broad area and it's just getting started. So do you want to talk, who wants to talk to their dog? Who wants to talk to their mole rat? Very interesting that there's a, a solid work being done. Yes. You were saying something, Susan? I would hope that it would. No, just that I would hope that it seems it would be more practical maybe to be listening into the, their own conversations rather than us trying to communicate with them. Uh -huh. But you know, now, say you know, that example of, of the chicken, uh, <laughs> if we could detect that a chicken was in distress, one might be able to resolve it right. beneficially. Right. Now, they also, the people doing this work, one of the hopes is that this work will be transformative because it will provide new ways to communicate with these other sentient beings and these new ways to communicate will open up possibilities that never existed before. You know, that's one of the things I love about this kind of work in science is that when you have one of these new big understandings, it changes the world and what you're able to do with it. So I presume the comment about the chickens is that you figure they'll put on more weight with less food if they're not stressed. Okay, that's the, we know about these business guys. Well, we'll I, I don't know. Like, I, I understand. I spent uh, the years that I spent in Silicon Valley make me understand the motivation you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, the question is not what the new technology can do. The question is, how do we turn it into money? Now, I one of the articles that we have for today actually deals with that. Now, the next story is an environmental story, and uh, it is... To me, one of the most frightening that I have heard, the headline is the world is on the brink of five disastrous climbing climate tipping points. And so uh, now the climate crisis has driven the world to the brink of multiple disastrous tipping points. And 
Uh, at, <clears throat> right now, we are at 1.1 C of warming, and uh, they're saying five dangerous tipping points may already have been passed. And these include the collapse of Greenland's ice cap, uh, which they now say is inevitable, and the collapse of a key current in the North Atlantic, uh, which disrupts the rain upon which billions of people depend for food. That's kind of a problem. And then the present abrupt melting of carbon rich permafrost, which is going on now. And let me uh, give you a display of this information. They published a nice chart with the article. And here we see across the top, the degrees of warming and down here, we see the tipping point. And so here we are. This is about 1.5 C. And that's got the collapse of Greenland ice sheet. It also has the collapse of the West Arctic ice sheet. I don't know how. I don't know how many feet of ocean rise that is. They have the coral reef die off. They have the northern permafrost thaw and then the Barents Sea ice loss. So those are the ones that we're facing right now. And then uh, coming as the heat goes up, we have the Labrador Sea current collapse. I don't know what that is. Maybe that's the what we talked about, the change that's going to affect the weather in the northern hemisphere. The mountain glacier loss, that adds another uh, few inches to the global sea rise. Then that's at two degrees. And at two and a half degrees, we have the shift of the West African monsoon. That's what feeds all the people in India and China and Southeast Asia and stuff like that. Then uh, we have coming up the East Antarctic glacier collapse, which adds a few more feet to the water. Amazon rainforest die back. Northern permafrost collapse. Then at four degrees, we have Atlantic current collapse and northern forests die back and expand to the north. And then at six degrees, we have the Arctic winter sea ice collapse. And then at about seven and a half degrees, we have the East Antarctic ice sheet collapse. That's what will bring three or 400 feet of uh, sea level rise so uh that's the stuff we have ahead of us if we don't do anything and this is another case where it says to maintain livable conditions on earth and enable stable societies we must do everything possible to prevent crossing these tipping points and, uh, you know, it turns out every fraction of a degree that we stop beyond 1.5 C reduces the likelihood of more tipping points. And this uh, quote from this uh, guys who wrote this study, our new work provides compelling evidence that the world must rapidly accelerate decarbonizing the economy. To achieve that, we need to trigger what he calls positive social tipping points. And so mm -hmm. 
Uh, I kind of agree with those sentiments. I wonder what are these positive social tripping points that we can do to help us prevent all this stuff? Any ideas, folks? Uh, CBC Radio recently revisited the ozone. The, remember the hole in the yes. ozone? Yes. That's like, what, 30, 35 years ago? Yes. Yes. We and actually they, did something about Yeah. Well, and they say they need to be three things. And of course, I forget what they are, but it has to affect you personally. Like they're, uh, it, it has to be pertinent. And there was a, so there were, you know, they were teaching school kids that McDonald's was selling hamburgers in the styrofoam clamshells and the uh -huh. styrofoams had CFCs in them. You know, you know, you could take out your hairspray and your um, your deodorant, you know, and, and mm -hmm. a stick is a fix kind of thing, like stick deodorants instead of the spray deodorants. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but apparently one of the things was there was a limited number of companies that were manufacturing the CFCs, and they realized that um, that if they if they didn't you know get on board and get ahead of things, then the government would be regulating them. So it it doesn't it doesn't get over to climate change quite so much. But I mean. Uh, oh. I suspect you know, one of those tipping points has to do with uh, eating beef, particularly, you know, and uh, some of the... Uh, way, way, yes, that's important, but way before that is fossil fuels. And, you right. know, with 3D, 3D printed um, solar panels, if, if solar and wind becomes less expensive... Uh, Which it's doing. I'm not so sure about batteries, but maybe this new battery that uh, has nothing to do with lithium and, and right. the, you know, the <laughs> problem. With, I think it's aluminum salt and forget what the third thing is, but it's mm -hmm. a solid state battery. Right. Again, there are lots of uh, lithium free batteries in the development pipeline. Yeah. So I didn't talk about uh, the energy transformation uh, as much because at some level, I think that's already a, a done deal. We have the technologies we need to be able to do it. We're making those technologies a lot better and a lot cheaper and there's enormous amounts of investment. And I think with the movement to uh, away from fossil fuels that we are almost to the tipping point there. And so, you know, I feel like those changes are already kind of baked into the economy. Things are gonna be drastically different in a few years, both with energy production and with uh, automotive pollution because yeah. of that. Maybe, but but fossil fuels do. Uh, gasoline is is a useless byproduct so far as the fossil fuels industry is concerned. That's not where ESO makes their money. They make their money on the lubricants and right. you know, the big machinery that's uh, being used for mining and things like that. Uh, I, I'm not sure and. I mean, are we all wearing clothing that's just made from linen and cotton and other crops that can mm -hmm. be grown? I don't know about that. I guess, certainly, so. there, there are lots of details about it. Uh, one of the things that is going to happen, though, in the petroleum industry is they're going to need to pump a lot less out of the ground when you don't have to uh, run cars from gasoline. No, no, gasoline is a byproduct. That's I know, but they, they still... It's if, not um, why they pump it out of the ground. Anyway, uh, you may be right. They're still going to need well, less oh, of it. Sorry, that info comes from my husband that worked for ESO for many, many uh -huh. decades. Uh-huh. Anyway, I certainly understand what you're saying. I still think 
that we're on the way to deal with that. One of the thing, reasons why I read of that is uh, one set of developments that is happening is high performance, uh, performance synthetic lubricants are also one of the things that they're able to uh, make now and they have to ramp up the production processes to you know get the volume and yields they need to make them economic so again there is an enormous amount of research that is going on in this area most of which isn't visible mm. the transition is so difficult oh, no, look yes. at what happened in germany shutting down their nuclear electric plants mm -hmm. uh, transitions are hard Yep, California now choked, not having enough electricity, and they had uh, demanded that all the nuclear electric plants be shut down. Uh huh. Transitions take time. Right. They're not immediate. Take time, and they take focus, and there are problems that you never anticipated along the way. That's for Solar sure. And, and wind are both moving uh, uh, forward very rapidly, mm -hmm. but it's not instantaneous. Right. Well, and there's going to be a decrease in hydroelectric power. Me because there's less water. Close. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep. With the, they're not talking about drought in California anymore. They're talking about aridification. In other words, permanently drying up. Mm -hmm. It yeah. turns out about five years ago in California, they said in the in this century they expect a forty year long extreme hyper drought like you've never seen before, and it seems like they're entering that period. Yeah, yeah. And in the meantime, California agriculture consumes over eighty percent of the water. Right. And yes. it is priced so low that uh, agriculture has no motivation to conserve. Uh, Transitions are hard. <laughs> now, the next article deals with that from a little bit different view. And Kohei Saito has a book that came out two years ago, uh, Capital in the Anthropocene. And it's become a uh, unlikely bestseller among young people in Japan. Uh, the author says the climate crisis will spiral out of control unless the world applies emergency breaks to capitalism and devises a new way of living. And uh, the book written around this idea, as I say, has become a surprise bestseller. And his message is simple. Capitalism's demand for unlimited profits is destroying the planet and only degrowth can repair the damage by slowing down social production and sharing wealth and this means an end to things like mass production and mass consumption of wasteful goods like fast fashion that susan was talking about I don't think any of us are partaking in fast fashion. We don't look like those, but it's a real issue. And he advocates decarbonization through shorter working hours and prioritizing essential labor intensive work, such as caregiving. The caregivers, these people are at the bottom of our economy and the most poorly paid now. He was inspired by Karl Marx's writings on the environment. And as I say, it's become an unlikely bestseller. And it is uh, 
sold more than half a million copies since it was published two years ago. An English translation is on the way. The author is very straightforward about this. He says, I advocate for degrowth and growing beyond capitalism. He says, the pandemic has magnified inequalities in advanced ec economies. And because of this, the book has struck this nerve with the younger Japanese who live in a world where they're faced with the consequences of all of this. He's telling a story that is easy to understand. He doesn't say that there are good things and bad things about capitalism or that it's possible to reform it. He says, we have to get rid of the entire system, which I think is a pretty big change. But he says, now young people were badly affected by the pandemic and face other big issues in their life, like environmental destruction and the cost of living crises. So this simple message resonates with them. And that our response to COVID-19 has showed that uh, rapid change is actually possible. We learned during the pandemic that we can dramatically change our way of life overnight. And we did that. And that makes it easier for a lot of these environmental issues. But now capitalism is trying to bring us back to what they think is a normal way of life. And uh, anyway, so this idea, I think we will start to hear more of. Uh, in the US, the problem with these ideas is that they uh, come from Marx, and we have Marx as a bad guy, but Marx was actually interested in sustainability, and he wrote about how non-capitalist and pre-capitalist societies are sustainable, which means they're not growth-driven, and that it's impossible to imagine a future in which we can keep growing the economy and at the same time live <laughs> in a sustainable manner without fundamentally changing our way of life. And uh, he, the final quote from him is, if economic policies have been failing for 30 years, then why don't we invent a new way of life? The desire for that is suddenly there. I think he says 30 years because he's 35 years old and he doesn't realize it's been going on longer than that. But anyway, uh, what do we hear? What do we think about uh, Marxism as a solution to the environmental problem? Go Marx. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, we associate Karl Marx with a, a communist uh, uh, system, and we think of China and Russia as being communist. But they're, they're not. not Marxists. No, nowhere near it. Marx is more a philosopher than a politician. I mean, he was a philosopher. Right. And and I this, found... is some of, this is some of his thinking. I think, frankly, it's a, an idea whose Time has come. Capitalism can't sustain itself forever. Right. Uh, and I think because it's based on, uh, well, greed and cons consumption. And uh, I don't think we can continue that forever. So right. maybe a time has come. I noticed right. that the, the book that's coming out in the English language is going to be a, a textbook, unfortunately. But, oh. but I understand. I understand that there's another book coming out that will be more more readable. Okay, okay. I didn't realize that uh, we were going to get the textbook first. 
And uh, yeah, someone, think, someone uh, who's had to read Columbia textbooks, University I don't think somebody. it's hard to imagine <laughs> curling up with it in the evening. Right. Now, also, I thought about Marx. I, you know, I spent uh, some time studying anthropology, and I thought Marx gave a useful viewpoint. You know, he talked about understanding money and the flow of money to uh, look at the power within a society and culture. Uh, I took money and generalized it to cultural valuables. <laughs> And if you use that as an analytical framework for uh, an, uh, looking at different cultures, then it works just fine. In the case, for example, of the Pacific Islanders, the men used to get their value while they were on the mainland from hunting animals, but the animals they hunted didn't exist on the island. So what they had to, they didn't have any way to be able to add these cultural valuables into their society. So the men started these uh, men's group religious societies where they control the access to the gods and they got their cultural valuables by their access to these incorporeal beings. And you know, they still were able to get their cultural goodies. They just had to uh, change the coin of the realm. Hmm. Well, degrowth de is very important. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Isn't it? Uh, I thought somebody said that if the whole planet lived the, like the way the first world does, that we would need four planets to support right. the, the the population of the world. Actually, degrowth. Uh, hopefully, the the population um, is not. It's uh, what is it? The women of the world. I think it, it's something like two point one um, babies surviving right, right. offspring or something. And I think the world population is below that. I mean, and that's, that's right. The the growth, we are very close to bending the curve on total population in the on the planet. And what we don't know is when the max population mm -hmm. will be, but it looks like it's going to be sometime between 2030 and 2050. And not a day too soon, I would say, from the planet's yes. point of view. Yes, yes. Anyway, so, and I've already read independent of him, people, uh, economists who are saying, what do we do for our poor capitalist economy when we don't have a growing population? The capitalists want to keep growing their products and having more people is the easiest way to sell more stuff. And if we don't have more people, what do we do? What is it? Uh, non fungible uh, tokens or something like, oh, like that's that? That's not what we do. That's not what we do. <laughs> anyway, excuse me. You know, so far, our working with imaginary money made on computers doesn't seem to be as good as the imaginary money that we thought we had in the banks. Well, or printed on plastic as well. Well, I think it's all imaginary. It's just which, what's the level of fantasy? Yes. It's less <laughs> fantasy if I can hold something in my hand. Yeah, but if it's a piece of plastic, it doesn't even have any intrinsic, you know, of gold of coin. But what <laughs> intrinsic value does some piece of metal have? Well... Anyway, so that's why I think the whole thing is just made up. I, when my daughter was about six, I had to explain to her how money is real and not real. And did maybe, she get maybe, it? She got maybe it. Maybe explain it to us one day. <laughs> <laughs> no, it uh, takes a six-year-old mind to understand it, and we're past that stage. There's some truth to that. Well, NPR had a whole, you know, uh, this is traveling somewhere, 
uh, to relatives in Quebec and we get the Vermont NPR station and we're kind of, does it come in yet? Does it come in yet? <laughs> and they had a whole thing on, on no matter what monetary system you have, it's, it's just because people agree that there's value right. there. Exactly. Right. Nothing right. has intrinsic value. Yes. I remember when I was in the in the 1970s, I went through S training from Warner Earhart, <laughs> and one of the things he said is, "Reality is by agreement." <laughs> you mean it's the matrix after all? Anyway, I think so. I it kind of fit me because I had always been on the outside of that agreement, and I help me understand why people were just trying to cancel my vote. <laughs> anyway, so the next story is uh, kind of a COVID story. It is a COVID story, I guess. And the question is, why are American lives getting shorter? U.S. life expectancy got worse during COVID-19 and then just kept getting worse. And uh, life expectancy in the American has suffered a historic drop in the last couple of years. Uh, and of course, while every demographic life expectancy drop, Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous communities were hit the Long hit the hardest. The, this is based on a CDC report, so it is a pretty credible so source. And their research shows that the pandemic impact on lifespan in America has been massive and its effect may persist for years the average life expectancy for all groups of America has gone down since 2019 from 79 years to 76 years, three years, about a 5% drop in lifespan, which is a pretty big chunk. And it turns out if you look at the 21 advanced countries in the world, 19 of them, all of them had a drop in lifespan in uh, the first year of the pandemic. And all of them, except two, showed recovery in lifespan in the second year. The two countries that didn't were the US and Israel. And I don't know what the case is in Israel, but in US, it's kind of funny. We have a health system where we spend the most money per capita in the world on our health system. And uh, our uh, competitive open market system hasn't done the job of protecting the people. The reason why the death rates are still not recovering a lot of that reason ends up being the effect in uh, non-white communities who are underserved by health care and often have other related problems in their ability to have a good quality of life, and uh, particularly their ability to have access to high quality health care. And so those problems are not just little problems. Those are problems that are affecting the life expectancy of uh, Americans. And some of the examples of uh, the disparities in lifespan are pretty staggering. Did you know the average lifespan in the U.S. of a black man is 10 years less than that of a white woman? 10 years. I knew that, that this, the disparity was there. I didn't have any idea it was that extreme. 
And so uh, these drivers of the death during COVID were already uh, involved in these bad US health outcomes. And the thing is that our system is so complicated that there's no one policy we can do to change, to turn the trend around. That's why we're, they're saying, uh, this is what we're gonna have for the next several years. So don't yeah, die. The failure, the failure in the United States to provide universal basic health care yes. is Big damn issue. Yes. Fancy health care is one thing, but basic health care right. is critically important for for uh, the economy of, of any country. Right. And the U.S. does not have it. Right. And, uh, you know, these the excess deaths that we have, if you look at them, each one of them has had a profound effect upon the family you know, where it occurred. You know, in addition to what uh, Norma just said, if you look at the at the U.S. way of life, uh, we have massive drug overdoses. We have guns, chronic disease related to health care, uh, anti-vaxxers, air pollution, climate change. Uh, they're not, some of these aren't just American things, but I think in the U.S. they're they're more severe because of the politics involved. Right, and what Norman was talking about, the lack of universal health care. Absolutely. You know. And not just basic health care. I right. mean, the other countries, it's, it, it's like everything almost everything is covered right right uh i pay for it when i buy a bottle of wine <laughs> no i mean you know it's all through government taxes so the sin taxes help as well that's that's just a, a joke saying but uh, so my husband and i are windsurfers and or my ex uh, my now deceased husband <laughs> and i have been going to cape hatteras um, so in North Carolina, um, since 1986, and we were just going to a restaurant there and it's an all you can eat buffet and it's king crab legs. And they, the waitress is serving these things on a cafeteria tray. And my when he needs his next tray of king crab legs and she's buzzing back and forth to the table of grossly obese Americans next to us. And I mean, now the Canadian population is starting to, to look very much the same, like just gross there. And, and people have put on weight during the, the pandemic. But we used to be shocked to see how many obese Americans are. And obesity puts you at risk for everything, cancer, heart disease, yes. diabetes. Um, and if you've got those underlying things to begin with, then, of course, you're going to be more susceptible to COVID. And, of course, if you don't get vaccinated when you get COVID, it's going to be worse for you. So, yep. Uh, and as Norman said, it doesn't have an easy answer. I mean, you have to think that in other countries, the money spent on health care isn't going into the pockets of the, of the shareholders of the insurance companies. I mean, private health care is an obscenity. Well, I think when we take and, capitalism and down, that, we can take private health care down too. I, I and I say that as uh, somebody who spent forty years as a private healthcare provider, mm -hmm. uh -huh. as a veterinarian, mm -hmm. and and it's not the way to look after a population. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me close now with or get the final story. We're running over time because we like to talk to each other so much. 
and the talking to each other is the most important thing we do, I think. But the last story is China and India both have approved new nasal COVID uh, vaccines. And the question becomes, are these nasal vaccines really the game changer we need? So two needle-free COVID-19 vaccines that are developed through the nose or mouth have been approved for use in China and India. One is with an aerosol mist and the other is with drops in the nose. And these mucosal vaccines target the thin mucous membranes that line the nose, mouth, and lungs. And by prompting the immune responses where the virus first enters the body, in theory, these could prevent even mild cases of illness and importantly, block transmission to other people, which is not done by any of the other vaccines. And so vaccines that produce this sterilizing immunity, they say, would be game changers. This, uh, the United States needs to catch up in this area. There are presently more in the world, more than 100 mucosal vaccines that are in development, and 20 have reached uh, clinical human trials. So, uh, this, the Chinese vaccine is being offered as a booster dose. The Indian vaccine is being offered as a two dose preliminary inoculation. And uh, there's still not enough testing data about either of them where we have good information about their effectiveness and particularly the critical thing that they're concerned about is their ability to reduce uh, the uh, infections that are transmitted to other people. If they are in fact good at preventing these, uh, these kind of infections, then we may start to have a way to be able to control uh, COVID. So let us hope. And treating a respiratory disease with uh, directly makes logically just a hell of a lot more sense. Yes. Yeah. And there yes. are other na nasal vaccines that are around for other diseases that are already mm -hmm. there and effective. So it's nothing new. It's just applying an existing idea to COVID. Yes. Yeah, in veterinary medicine, the intranasal vaccines for uh, respiratory diseases are more effective. The dilemma is administering them. But if you're needle phobic, maybe, maybe that'll get more people to have the intranasal vaccines. Uh huh. Certainly, having a mist, I can imagine the thing that's administered as a mist would be easy because you just put a mask over their nose and put the mist in, and it's well. The remember the the photo of the it it looks like a drink cup with a, a so you have to stick it in your nose and breathe it in. Ah, okay. Okay. Or if it's drops, you have to tip your head back right, and have right. the drops. So, right. so there are some um, challenges with administering intranasal vaccines, but definitely okay. producing the immunity, especially because the original COVID infected the, the angiotensin II receptor cells in the lungs, whereas Omicron definitely likes to infect the mucosal cells in the nose. Mm -hmm. So... So that's why the hope is that it would, you know, prevent people from uh, spreading the the virus, because that's that's how it gets around. You know, people yeah. are spreading for three days or so, maybe five days before they know they've got it. What is the asymptomatic spreader? Sorry, the cat's right. thinking he wants to be right. up on my lap. Right. Anyway, anyway, that's what we have for today. 
and uh, I think it was a good session, and I enjoyed our contact together, and we'll see you next week. Okay, thank you so much. Adios. Thank you, Richard. You're certainly welcome. My pleasure.